give a warm welcome to Matt. Well, thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm Matt. <laughs> so, <laughs> appreciate it. I'm glad you're the writer. I, I know, I know. That'd be bad. So, my name is Matt Cranfield. I am a nurse, you guys. Um, how many clinicians do I have in the room today? Mostly clinicians? Okay. Um, you know, the point of this education day is not to tell you how a vacuum works, okay? My point is to teach you how negative pressure aids in the modality, you know, different modality of care that's actually in how the mechanism of action works. So I'm going to try not to bore you to death right after lunch. So I like interaction, I like questions, I want to get the most of it. Before I get started though, you know, I am a WOCN. I, I love wounds. I'm sick in the head. I, I don't know why I fell in love with wounds. When I was a trauma nurse, I thought I'd never do wounds before, okay? Because back then, we shoved gauze and everything, changed it every four hours, and it goes against every principle now in wound care. But that's what we did. And we tied people to the bed even if they was on a rock rhodium drip and paralyzed and sedated because we don't want them to move. So a lot's changed, but I fell in love with the wounds because what I found about wounds are it impacts the patient. And in the critical care, I never saw it. Oh, we saved their life. Great. Well, they just you know, developed a D-cube the size of a baseball on their bottom because we didn't turn them. And what we didn't see, that patient just spent the next six months to a year in rehab facilities, in hospitals, home health care, and not be able to you know, be a functioning member of society again because of something we caused. I think at that point when I realized, like, oh, I love wounds. And I kind of pursued a wound care path. Um, I, like she said, I've, I've consulted for several larger um, companies for um, negative pressure and different wound therapies over the years. I've enjoyed what I've learned and experienced. So hopefully, I just want to share some of it with you guys today. Not putting one to sleep, and you know, you know, be make sure you ask questions too. Beautiful thing about wound care, you guys, is you can get 12 CWCNs right in a row. Put uh, put us in a room. We're all going to disagree on things. 90% of wound care is experience based. The other 10% is actually research based. Because for the longest time, wound care was seen beneath everyone. No one wants to mess with it. You know, it's like, eh, it's like an afterthought. Now it's starting to become more scientifically researched and carried on on how we treat these wounds. One thing that we're all agree with, and it's research proven, you always want to keep a wound moist, not wet, not dry. So if you get anything out of this lecture today, just always remember, and the number one goal, if you have a wet wound, you want to do stuff to dry it out. You know, control, not exudate. If you have a dry wound, you want to add moisture to it. Because what happens when cells become oversaturated? They swell, 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 explode, and it doesn't do anything. What happens when cells are dehydrated? Shrink, 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 die. I mean, I can't put any more simple than that. So if you remember anything about wound care, if you're ever scratching your head as a clinician on what to do or how to treat a wound, it's simple. Is it wet? Is it perfect or is it dry? And if you treat it along those lines, and there's many different products out there, from negative pressure wound therapy, which I love because it, it creates a moist wound environment, removes excess exudate, all those positive things. But if you look at it like, okay, well, I got a wet wound. Well, what do I want to use to control it? Maybe it's an alginate, you know, something along those lines with a secondary dressing. I got a dry wound. Maybe I just use some Curlex and Hydrogel. Um, so just remember out of this whole lecture, what I want you to get is actual wound care knowledge. I want you to understand negative pressure and the mechanism of action, but it's really important to understand how to treat a wound and go from there. And, you know, I, I, I brought up the CWOCNs earlier. I know the Higher Health Care Association believes um, heavily, so do I, in certifications and stuff. What's neat about certifications, if you do get them, it just kind of trains you to think a little differently. It's not going to tell you what to do always. It just gives you the next level of expertise so you can make an educated best decision. And with wound care, you guys, the biggest thing I tell people are, after two weeks, if something's not working, don't continue it. You know what, you have to look and be able to try new things. And with that, we'll get into my lecture, but what else goes into wound healing? Is it just the dressing I put on? Diet, nutrition, right? There's so many different things that go in wound healing. Pressure reduction, if it's on a you know, posterior surface. So you always have to keep remember when someone's not healing, why are they not healing? Diabetic, their blood sugar is averaging 500, and they eat a pack of Snickers a day and smoke a pack of smokes a day. You know, those type of patients are hard to heal. Um, so always just keep that in mind. That's kind of how I open up all my lectures. I, I do this quite a bit, actually. And 
uh, just real important, you know, just the basic fundamentals of wound care. And the reason why I talk about negative pressure is, one, I work for a company that does negative pressure, but the main reason I talk about negative pressure is because negative pressure covers a lot of those areas that we're looking for to promote a healthy wound bed. So, I appreciate the introduction. That was a long introduction bio there. I was going to fall asleep during it, so I apologize for putting you guys through it. So, um, we'll go ahead and get rolling here. Move back and forth. I don't think I have a clicker, do Oh, I do have a clicker. Cool. Let's see if I can break it. So, history of negative pressure, I'm not going to spend that much time on. I do love this picture, you guys, though, just from an educational purpose, is with a wound definition. There's the textbook definition, right? We understand it. Wound is a break through the skin, through the dermis, into fat, into muscle, into as far down as it needs to go. That wasn't, we don't walk around with wounds, right? So that's all it is. And I love this picture because when I teach wound care, I separate out. You know, top layer of skin is the epidermis, and your next layer is dermis. Epidermis is dead. Dermis is your live layer. That's where all your nerve endings are found. This is where your sebaceous glands are found. That's where you get the fillings um, of touch, even pain in your skin. Below that, you have adipose, muscle, bone, tendon from there. So what's really important is, when you're talking about wound care, another thing that's really good to differentiate from is a full thickness injury or partial thickness. What's partial thickness mean? Anyone? Don't be shy, I promise you. <laughs> partial thickness is when it's located still in the dermis. For example, burns, we used to classify them as first degree, second degree, and third degree, right? Or really bad, whatever, charred is what we used to call them. Burns have even gone to this. Is it partial thickness or is it full thickness? A partial thickness injury is found in the dermis. That means you still have a chance before you to heal this thing up to get them to re before it goes into fat and becomes a full thickness. Once it reaches a full thickness injury, that's bad. It's into fat. Um, you're looking at granulate the wound back in versus just re Does that kind of make sense? Partial thickness, put it in perspective. You drag your knee across this, get rug burn, and it's sore, painful, blister-like, as pressure also um, one and two is a partial thickness injury, so it hasn't made it quite through the dermis yet. Those are still salvageable wounds, but if you let them go, they turn into full thickness. And once they get into fat, and especially down to muscle, um, especially with bones involved, it just becomes harder and harder to heal these wounds. So remember, effects of wounds, you can read the slides, but what I like to tell people is, remember, wounds affect so much of a person. Mobility, psychosocial, even economical, if they can't work because they have a wound infection, a wound can really disable someone for a long period of time. Um, interesting fact, just so throw this out here as a tidbit, I found this really interesting. Back when I started my career, um, I remember on diabetic wounds we always used to amputate, right? Cut off the feet, and they're fine. We don't do that much or try not to do it. Do you know why? What'd you say? Oh, go it doesn't ahead. Doesn't work. Well, doesn't work. Yeah, we know that too. Correct. The mortality rate, five-year mortality rate, is higher than lung cancer. So if you amputate someone's foot that's diabetic, their five-year mortality rate is around 67, 68 percent. So that's why it's so important to heal wounds nowadays instead of just cut away stuff. Um, because, and everyone's like, oh my God, they're diabetic, they're you know, 56 years old and you're just cutting off part of the foot. Why? Because it affects so much of the body. You said it earlier. It never, they never get it all. It's osteomyelitis, it's always nasty. Cut, cut, cut. And you take away their you know, mentation in a way and also their physical and mobility, which kills the patient. So just remember that. You know, wound healing, I talked about this, biological process, ends with some type of trauma and finishes up with a scar. You have two types of injury, you have full thickness and you have partial thickness injury. Partial thickness, negative pressure is not used for partial thickness injury. Negative pressure does not grow new skin. Negative pressure fills in a wound. So if you put negative pressure foam, hydrophobic foam directly on skin, I had an old lady say this to me 17 years ago. I remember it to this day. So Matt, it's like a continuous hickey. I'm like, yeah, it is. It gives you the hickey effect. 
Same way with smooth muscle or anything along those lines. It will actually degrade it and eat through it. Negative pressure is made to fill in the wound. And what's really important for us nurses, we forget sometimes, we leave negative pressure on, it fills up. And we leave it on with a death like this. And we're still carrying it on and you're like, why won't it close? It's never going to close with negative pressure. And it's a misconception because once you fill the wound, you have to take negative pressure off and use another dressing for re to occur. So, you know, those are just some tidbits, you know, I try to hone in on in these type of lectures because I don't want to bore you, but it's also practical in your, in your practice. Um, and I see it all the time. And there's like, I've had this on for six weeks with a depth of 0.2. <laughs> Well, it's time for new skin to grow over. So, and and bad thing about wound care is we've done a horrible job as a nursing organization, as a whole, of educating people and and explaining to people on how stuff works. Um, and that's where I get excited about doing these type of lectures. Told you I was a geek on this stuff. So, you know, the four principles of wound care. I think we all know this. If we don't, it's a good review. Remember, the black stuff's escar, necrotic tissue. I call it beef jerky. The yellow stuff is called slough. Um, if there's necrotic tissue in the wound base, you have to remove it. They usually do debridement. Some people like taking four weeks and using a, a, a chemical debridement, um, which I don't, um, but some people do. The biggest thing is if there's necrotic tissue covering up and encompassing most of the wound bases, your body is amazing. Hey, it's got someone covering it. I don't know what it is. You don't have a wound anymore. It doesn't send the same chemical receptors. And if you're talking about negative pressure and you put it over the top of it, negative pressure has to have viable tissue to be able to pull blood flow up to it. So removal, removal of down dead tissue. I see some nurses get creative sometimes. They mechanically debride it. They put a wet to dry on, which you should never use, ever. But they do. Put a moist dressing, dry over the top, and then let it wet dry out and come rip it off. Um, which is a form of mechanical agreement that I strongly encourage not to do. But um, the next thing is provide moist environment. Like I said, you guys, you'll hear different opinions. Some people say mud and honey is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Other people hate it. You know, it, it just depends. What we forget to recognize is if we provide a moist environment, that's what actually heals the wound. You know, I used to get in arguments with um, a colleague of mine that loved meta honey. And I'm not saying it's a bad product, good product, or anything, but on venous stasis ulcers. I'm like, well, you could put algae on it if you compress it, you know, use compression. It's going to heal the wound. So, you know, keeping a concept, I'm controlling the drainage, controlling the swelling, and everything else along those lines. Preventing further injury. We're, we're usually pretty good about this, but sometimes we forget. Wounds on their bottom, even if it's not a pressure wound, saves the perirectal abscess. And they have a wound on their bottom, that's not pressure cause. Um, we, don't, we still have to turn them, reposition them. You know, when we run tubing and stuff, we need to make sure they're not laying on it along those lines. So we always have to prevent the further injury. Or another way I like to describe it is, whatever caused that wound, we need to relieve from it. If it's a diabetic wound, we need to do everything in our power diabetic education, control non-diabetes as much as possible. Last thing, we all know providing nutrition. How many people you guys ever look at pre-albumin or albumin levels? I do. So the old rule of thumb used to be if the pre-albumin is less than 10 or 11, they're never going to heal. It means their protein level is non-existent pretty much. <laughs> Dietitians will argue to death with you about this. They want us to keep track of protein intake and throw pre or um, pre or albumins and prealbumins to the side. The point is, if people's not getting protein for the basic building blocks of, of life, the wound's never going to heal. Is this too much for you guys, or just enough? Perfect. Okay, good. I don't want to put anyone to sleep. I I always hate speaking after lunch, so. Um, I talked about removal of non-viable tissue. Remember, remove it, it has to be removed. I put this picture up here for an oxymoron though, because this, this necrotic tissue, you would not remove actually. And you're like, well you just told me to remove it. Arterial ulcers or diabetic ulcers, if it's stable eschar, you never remove it. You let it dry out, they heal differently. It's a different type of wound. If it stays dry and doesn't look wet and nasty, you leave those alone. Yeah, go ahead. Do they 
why don't they ever look right though? They always look like there's a wound there. What the? I mean, I've had some like that and um, they just never really close. I mean, they don't. They won't, especially on arterial ulcer because until okay. you fix the blood flow. So it'll just look like, I mean, it's, it looks closed. Yeah, it's not. you can see it. Yeah, yeah it still has an okay. indentation so around it. You shouldn't do anything with that. Mm -mm. Okay. So a lot of nurses use skin prep, betadine, chlorhexidine you know, over the top of them to dry them out. You just want to keep them dry. Same way with a diabetic. And I hate talking about diabetics because believe it or not, diabetic wounds are a little different treatment course. They really truly are. But diabetic, same way, if you had stable eschar, and when I talk about stable eschar on a diabetic wound, firmly adherent eschar, that's dry. You do not debride that on a diabetic's foot. You let it dry out, and, and diabetic f foot will act differently. It will heal from the, underneath that and eventually kind of peel off and fall away. Um, I see, because what happens is, though, if you have eschar on a diabetic foot, people don't keep it dry. They want to put bacitracin all over it and everything else. It gets wet, and that wound becomes a gangrene, nasty mess. So diabetic feet, dry, all other eschar you pretty much remove besides arterial. So... Yeah. It's, it's been difficult at times. Um, I, I give several different lectures, and, and I'm from Indiana, Indianapolis area, and I actually, um, the larger health systems are there. I go and do physician dinners with them on the physician panels and teach wound care. I actually do that in Kentucky also. So it just, I usually, what I do is make the suggestion, um, hey, you know, you, we shouldn't be doing this. Just try it for me and let's see how it goes. Um, that's usually the best way I, I do it. It's also something to do with reimbursement if I'm not per it's per It does. Um, I, I'm, I'm not an expert in reimbursement codes, but you, you know, anytime you add any type of further care, especially if they're inpatient, then you know everything's DRG based pretty much. So you have you know CCs, MCCs, you know comorbidities on top of that that does increase the weight of reimbursement on things. But it's, it's tough because wound care is not even especially, and the bad thing about, and I'm not downing physicians at all or anything like that, but you have someone that's been a family practice doctor for 20 years that's gone in wound care, and they've treated with what to dry for the last 20 years. And it's one thing that's research proven not to do because you mechanically debride the wound every time. So it's just a big educational, and what I've found is the more nurses we educate to kind of push along the physicians, then it's a better response we're getting. And, and there are some good physician certifications out there now, too, for wound care, um, that more and more are actually encouraging to be taken. So. What about Dakins? How often is that being used? Dakins? Um, people still like it. I, I think it has this place, it punches holes right through. Um, bad thing with Dakin's, like Pseudomonas, 25% of all Pseudomonas are resistant to unless it's gone up since the last time I looked. Dakin's is a good short-term solution. Um, if it's killing the bacteria by punching holes through it, what is it doing to your cells too? Um, we used to use a ton of Dakin's and acetic acid too. Um, you know, like acetic acid works really well for a Cinerobacter. Um, Dakin's though, we pretty much stopped using because most of the pseudomonas that we ran across was resistance against it. So, um, I, I use a lot of silver still. And that comes and goes. Great questions though. I love it. I lost my clicker. Um, provide moist environment. I've, I know I've done this until I'm blue in the face. Scientifically proven. Research proven, scientific theory, you know, data proven. So that's everything we should do. Prevent further injury. With this is, it's important. You know, if someone does have a wound on their buttocks, they need to be on low air loss, gel overlay, or whatever they can qualify for. One thing we always forget, we always forget to, if they're sitting in their wheelchair, to have some type of wheelchair chair cushion too. Nutrition, we've talked about that until it's blue in the face. They need to eat. Um, now going to negative pressure just a little bit. Negative pressure promotes wound healing by different ways, mechanisms of action. These are theories. 
And so, how negative, we all, it's proven scientifically that negative pressure wound therapy works. How it works is, are still theories. Here's how I explain it to patients, make it real simple. I'm going to take your wound, I'm going to stuff some foam in your wound, cover it with sticky saran wrap, cut a little hole in the sticky saran wrap, put a little shop vac tube on it, and you're going to wear this thing 24-7. It's the human vacuum cleaner. It's going to suck away all the bad stuff and bring blood flow to it. Believe it or not, that's pretty accurate what it does. It reduces edema. It brings blood flow to the wound, promotes angiogenesis, new capillary bed formation, and it pulls away the bad bacteria. Pretty simple. It works well. Um, negative pressure's been around for, I think it launched in 90, actually 97, they say 96, but launched in 1997. I remember my first one I saw, I'm like, trauma patient coming out of surgery, I'm like, what is this? <laughs> so, um, it's been around, and the reason why negative pressure is still popular and still used is because it works, and it heals about 86 to 87 percent of all wounds. So when you look at it on that, it's like, oh my God, something that heals how much, you know, high percentage of wounds, that's pretty impressive. Average wear on negative pressure varies from region to region a little bit, around 42 days though. So it's a pretty impressive modality treatment, it really is. You know, studies show it goes far above the fluid balance, I talked about it. You know, it, you, you bring, remove the bad stuff, bring blood flow to it, promote angiogenesis, and it heals the wound from the inside out, you know, promotes granulation tissue, the beefy red hamburger looking tissue that we all want to see, and go from there. As a nurse, one thing you want to look at when you do do the negative pressure changes, everybody thinks the pump's only set at 125, because that's been around for years. This is a study done on two pigs in 1999. So that's how we got 125, believe it or not. One was this big a wound, the other one was this big, if I remember correctly. So with that is, if your wound looks kind of gray and dusky after negative pressure, you think it's too much pressure maybe? You can actually burst those capillary beds and cut off blood flow. So if you remove the dressing and it's kind of gray or even dark purple at times, it's a little darker generally, then you're probably providing too much pressure to that wound. If it stagnates out, same thing. Well, you know, when I talked about change modality treatment, we never think about changing pressure. We just don't. Um, I, I, I hate to even say this because it's controversial, but I'm going to say it. You know, um, like how I gauge my negative pressure is, I kind of, everything's about in tissue perfusion now, capillary membrane, you know, closure rates, everything else. I do it pretty simple. I have something that's 90 years old, 80 years old, and their resting blood and pressure is 80 systolic, I'm not sitting on my pump at 125. Their tissues are not used being perfused at that, so why would I provide counter vacuum pressure at that? It's going to freak out the body, you know, not very scientific there. So I kind of judge it off that. If I got an elderly patient, then I up it. Diabetic wounds goes back and forth on the research. Some people say set pressures lower because you're closing capillary membranes if you set too high pressures on diabetic with negative pressure. The trick with that is diabetes by nature, right? You get calcification of the wound or of the vessels and arteries. So what happens to the blood flow to the feet? Cuts off, right? Slows down. What kind of pressure is that being perfused at though? We all have garden hose, we stick our finger over to it. The pressure increases, the volume greatly decreases. Same kind of mentality think, even though it's further away from the heart. So what I've seen great success with on diabetic wounds, pressures are 150 to 175 negative pressure. Because the tissues that are used to being perfused with a high pressure. So they respond counteractive to a, a higher negative pressure. And like I said, you'll have someone here argue up and down with me. I'm just telling you what I've seen. I do a lot of negative pressure now and I see great success with those. My whole moral of the story is not to guide your practice, but to get you thinking of if something's not working, try something different. And look at those nursing cues that we pick up on every day that something doesn't look right, because it's not. If we think it doesn't look right, it's not. And, and let's do something about it. So everybody's so afraid to remove those pumps from 125, it seems like. So, you know, encourage you to call the physicians at that point, get the order change, or yeah, I, yeah.
Yeah. Standing orders. Yeah, a lot of places do have standing orders now. Um, no matter if they're older or younger. Yeah, 125. So, um, so, you know, any way we can educate and get better. So, if there's a whole lot of drainage with plenty of pressure, what would the indication be? Indication for increased drainage? What pressure wise? Mm -hmm. The old rule of thumb has always been if it's heavy exudating wound, larger wound, then you go 150. So that's always been the flow chart. If you look at the flow charts that's ever been published by everyone, the unofficial gold standard is 150 for heavy exudating wounds. And those are usually your abdominal wounds or your groin wounds along those lines. But wouldn't that also increase pressure to push more out? It does. I, yeah, that's the gold standard. So everybody used, yeah, everybody used to thought they had to increase the pressure to control the drainage. And I, I, I'll get real geeky on you guys here. So everybody used to, well, I got a lot of drainage, so the pump gets, keeps up with it, I got to increase the pressure. That's actually where that came from. That is so wrong. And what I mean by that is tire pressure. Let's think of a tire real fast. You go check your pressure. It's supposed to have 40 pounds in it. Great, 40 pounds. So that's 125. Pretend like that's 125. That's nothing more than a set point. Now, your tire gets low, right? You have to go put air in it. I don't know, and maybe this is, I'm a car guy, so maybe this isn't the best, <laughs> best, but we all seen those little air compressors you can plug in your cigarette lighter, right? Or 12 volt outlet. They don't even call them cigarette lighters anymore, I don't think. But 12 volt outlet. You go plug that in and try to put air in your car. It takes forever to get up to 40 pounds again, right? It'd take maybe 15 minutes to pump out air in, versus you go to a filling station, you grab the hose off a compressor, and it blows up 40 pounds in 20, you know, two seconds. And the reason why where I'm going with this is pressure's pressure, flow is flow. So a lot of home vacs are using four liters a minute, two to four liters a minute of flow. So that's what they can handle, two to four liters of flow a minute. It's kind of like your air conditioning in your car, too. Maybe that's a better thing. If I turn it on low, it's the same fan, but it's not moving that much air. Now I turn it on high, it's spinning faster, and it's moving a ton more air. So what happens is, on, especially in the home setting or even long-term care, it's usually not as powerful as pump in the acute care. So the flows aren't there to keep up with a heavy exudating wound. Say if a wound's draining a ton, it has a hard time keeping up with it. So what nurses used to do is go increase the pressure on it to think that's actually going to keep up with the flow a little better. It does for about two seconds indirectly, but if, they, if there's too much to overcome a pump, the house is still going to flood, right? So that's important. So, um, you know, that's one thing I focus big on my career with cork. I don't want to talk about cork, but, you know, that's why it was important to make a pump that's powerful than go across the continuum of care with the same pump because you run into those issues. I love it, this you guys. Hopefully, hopefully you guys find it somewhat beneficial. Anybody sleep yet? Not too bad. Anybody learning anything? That's the most important thing. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, you know, history of pressure. Hit on this real quick. I think it's important. Um, it's been around for over a hundred years. And when I talk about negative pressure. You used to take abdominal wounds, put gauze in it, put a flat drain on it, hook it to wall section with nothing covering it, maybe some gauze. It wasn't a true, occlusive, sealed system. A physician that I know, he's in Louisville, his name's Dr. Cherka, and then Dr. Jetter, when they was interns, or, or not interns, they was doing their fellowship, they actually said, oh, let's try it, cover it up with some tegaderms. And they hit success. And that's kind of where negative pressure actually blew up. Wake Forest took their resource because they use gauze base. Um, gauze comes clogged easy, so it's hard to even the pressure across the wound base. So Wake Forest got a hold of this technology. They found polyurethane foam works great. Sold it to KCI, and here we sit today. Um, I, I know I hit this over and over. We've talked about necrotic tissue has to go away. You know, dressing functions, I want to make sure I'm doing okay on time. What's beautiful about negative pressure is that, remember how I talked about maintaining a moist wound bed? Number one key, if you have a wet wound, the pump pulls away the excess exudate away from the wound bed, so it doesn't, 
explode, as I call it. If it's a drier wound where negative pressure is great too, it's a vacuum. It's a closed system. It's a truly closed system. I used to use a story, and then now when everyone looks at me like I'm crazy now, but does anybody remember the two liter Coke bottles with the black things on the bottom of them? They, they hold them up straight. <laughs> you don't? Okay, and Kyle does. So, we, as a kid, in one of my classes, we had to take them, cut one end of off, and glue the black thing to it. But before we glue the black thing to it, we put dirt and water in there and some plants and watch them grow and watch it rain. It's like a deuterium about. Negative pressure is kind of the same thing. It eventually figures out the perfect humidity balance inside that since it is a closed system. So if you have a dry wound, negative pressure actually adds moisture to that wound. If you have a little wetter wound, it pulls away the excess exudate to promote the optimal healing environment. Um, two types of dressing. You, you see foam in gauze base. Um, with foam, Foam is the most popular. Does anybody run gauze in here or ever seen gauze ran? Okay, probably not. Foam is, is the best because it doesn't come clogged as easily. It evenly distributes the pressure. So about 99% of all negative pressure orders are gauze or are foam. With that being said though, gauze does have arena. And this is actually research kind of proven and my, Matt Cranfield experience proven. Gauze works great for stagnant pressure ulcers that are not responding to foam. No clue why, I can't even make up something for you. The research, research says it's less traumatic and decreases macro and micro strain and all this. I don't even understand it completely. I just know it works. So, um, um, Medela actually did a lot of research on, on gauze base because there's a big gauze base negative pressure dressing and they actually came to the same conclusion on that. It does work. If you have stagnant pressure wounds, for some reason gauze base seems to do really to get them stimulated again. I think I've never seen any gauze base. Oh really? Yeah, you just, um, usually antimicrobial gauze. You put a layer in the base. You put a flat drain down first. I'll show you a picture in a second. Gauze over the top, tegaderm. You take some wax or stoma paste around the tubing that's come out to seal it, and that's your gauze base negative pressure. Um, like I said, for the stagnant pressure wounds, I'm actually a firm believer in them. Yeah. Oh yeah, so they're, they're cheap, easy to do too. What's nice too, gauze won't break down the skin either. So if you do get some touching good skin, you don't have to worry about causing uh, additional wounds. So foam dressings, hydrophobic, you guys, black foam. Hydrophobic reticulator means it returns back to its regular shape. Hydrophobic means it hates water. Your wound base hates water too. Has anybody cleaned a wound and knows that water kind of sheds away from it? It's hydrophobic. Why do you have to remove the negative pressure foam after two hours if the pump's off? Does anybody know? So biggest mistake I see, the pump alarms. Nurses leave it in there and just shut off the pump, right? That's bad. Reason why you have to remove the foam is your wound base is hydrophobic, your foam is hydrophobic. It causes a natural pulling effect of bacteria into that foam. And I, ter I call it the Motel 6 breeding ground at this point because you don't have the pump pulling away the bacteria. So it sits there against the wound base and causes an infection. The gold standard is two hours. So another thing, if you learn anything today, if the pump's off more than two hours, remove the dressing and place a moist dressing into the wound. And for you, who, who does home health in here? Okay, majority. And same way with your patients. Um, usually what I tell your patients is if they can't get it fixed and you can't make it out there in two hours, which is usually the case, hey, whatever dressing you was using prior to negative pressure, you need to remove the foam. You got to teach them how to do that. Um, because if not, you can cause the wound go from, every wound is colonized pretty much, but you could critically colonized and or infected or systemic infection. So. How, how do you know when, when you need to do that? Because <clears throat> it will alarm for other reasons. Correct. So vacuum negative pressure is nothing more than vacuum. If they're getting a leak alarm, that means the vacuum has been lost. If they can't fix the leak alarm, 
That's what you mean when you take it off. Yep. Okay. So, yep. If any alarm you cannot resolve, so blockage, same thing. Um, cancer full, they should be able to resolve a cancer full, be able to switch the cancer. A blockage is usually the most simple one. They usually got the tube and kink clamped or something along those lines. But if they get a leak alarm and they can't fix it, it does no good to just silence the alarm or turn off the alarm because you lost a vacuum. You're not pulling away now bacteria anymore, and you're just going to cause a bad mess. Um, hydrophobic hates water, repels water. It's not a sponge, you guys. It's coarse. It doesn't feel good, and it will shed water away from it. The other is white foam. Um, it's hydrophilic. It's like a sponge. It loves water. Why would you use white foam then? What do you say? Exposed structure. What are exposed structures? Yep. So bone tendon, especially um, exposed hardware. Bone and tendon, if you let dry out, it dies. Um, so if you put white foam down first and then black foam over the top, it keeps it moister, um, promotes, um, keeps it from dying. Also, you use white foam in tunneling. So tunneling is, um, you don't want to use black foam in tunneling because if you cut black foam in these little tiny ribbons, it can shred on you. So if you stuff it back in a six, seven, eight centimeter tunnel and go pull it back, a piece of it can break off and you'll never know. Oh, the wound healed up. Now the patient has a huge abscess and it's going to open up into a big nasty mess. White foam has a stronger tensile strength. One rule of thumb is on white foam, we talked about pressures earlier, they actually recommend for most white foam to increase the pressure by 25 millimeters of mercury. It is harder to pull through white foam. I hate white foam with a passion. I do not use it. I use bone tendon, I use hydrogel and certain little pieces of Zeroform or Adaptic over it. And my tunnels, I use antimicrobial gauze because there's actual research proven so I can teach you. Um, it decreases stroma formation and actually promotes wound healing better. And with gauze, nurses are less likely to overpack gauze than they are white foam. White foam, I don't know, we get in there and it's like a spring. We just like putting it in there. You don't ever overpack a tunnel. You pack it in gently, pull back a half centimeter, leave a pigtail hanging out, touching your foam. I have great luck with the antimicrobial gauze. Curlex. When you pack when the big tip first came out, yep. I think they recommended using the tunnel that they use or something like that. What changed? What changed? They made white foam. Mm -hmm. So I thought they had white first before they <coughs> Nope, they actually had um, black first. Black was it. Then what happened was, because this is actually when I, during the time frame I consulted for KCI, because I, um, I kind of switched over to their negative pressure line because I used to do their turning beds. And black foam came out first. Then people were cutting it and putting a tunnel, undermining. Like one wound I remember that I did, it was one that literally in the pelvic floor, I reached in through the abdominal, go up, around, down, and there's a tunnel in between the symptoms and his pubis there and we was putting black foam in. That's what we was taught to do. It broke off and the patient got huge abscess. So, um, still, because that's what I was at. So they came out with white foam. Then they, they used to promote white foam for the bone tendon and more telling is actually why it was invented though. Because white foam collects water. So a lot of times I, I think it causes pseudomonas and other bacteria to grow in there and causes nasty, nasty mess. That's why I don't like it. <laughs> Any other questions on white foam? <coughs> silver. Who likes silver in here besides me? Great. You know where how the term we was all or people born with a silver spoon in their mouth came from? Kind of the same principle here, back in the dark ages. People who the wealthy who ate from silver and drink from silver chalices, their kids lived. They didn't die and they lived and they, were, they did well. Silver is antimicrobial, as we all know. It um, kind of punches holes to the cell wall. Unless something has changed in the last 60, 90 days, nothing's resistant against it. Silver works great for a wound that is clear, critically colonized. It controls the bacteria. 
Silver should not be used any longer than two weeks because um, you can actually make a wound sterile in a way and cause a cytotoxic kill also. Because remember, when you kill bacteria, the bacteria is not really what makes it sick, is it? It's the endotoxins, right? So, for the most part. So when we go in there and kill a bunch of bacteria, we release a lot of endotoxins. And when we release a lot of endotoxins, then your wound can kind of look ill again. I know that's a pretty pathetic way of putting it, but it can, it can set it back. So silver foam came out, and you hardly ever see it in the home care because it's so expensive. But the bad thing about silver foam is it's kind of like silvadine. Silvadine's great for releasing all the silver in the first four to eight hours, or about four hours on silvadine. The foam does it in about four to eight. It's not bound correctly to it or not as good as a contact layer. So you get a big cytotoxic kill in the first four to eight hours. And you get nothing after that. Um, so if you do use silver, my moral of the story is, you guys all probably have access to a silver contact layer. You know, it's Silver Lawn, Tegaderm AG, something along those lines. Even Silver Alginate works well because it dissolves underneath negative pressure. You can always use that, or Acticoat Flex, whatever you have. You can always use that underneath your negative pressure instead of Silver Foam because you're not going to get it at home for one. And it actually has a better release rate, parts per million per hour, than Silver Foam does. minutes. Um, contact layer, there's all different types of contact layers out there. Oil emulsion, Adaptic is probably one of the most popular ones that everyone uses. I love Mepitel, I love Versatil, or Mepitel is the name brand, Versatil is the Medline version, the silicone base ones, but it's expensive. They all work the same, um, in my opinion. It's something to keep the foam from sticking to the wound or any other secondary dressing. Uh, many different types out there. Port pad, suction flange. That's what provides suction to the wound. We all know that. The biggest thing is on this is you do not want your patient laying on this. You should never put the port pad directly on a butt wound. You build foam around, you build a bridge. Uh, indications for use. I do want to go over this actually. I get this asked a lot. A lot. So, Matt, when is a wound appropriate for negative pressure? Here's the simple questions I ask. Is it full thickness? Yes, it is. Great. Does it have less than 20% eschar in the wound? Yes. Good. Is there cancer present in the wound? No. Good. Is there bone present? Yeah, there is, but we rule out osteomyelitis. Or, yes, there's bone, but we're treating the osteomyelitis. That's okay at that point. Am I using it to treat a fistula? No. Okay, great. Negative pressure is appropriate. So in reality, if it's full thickness injury, no matter how large or small it is, negative pressure is appropriate modality treatment if it doesn't have those contraindications to it. You, go ahead, ask. Yeah. Why do the physicians want the wound back discontinued when they find out they have osteomyelitis? I have no clue why, because the guidelines are on osteomyelitis is that one, you, you, if you're not treating it, if it's positive for osteomyelitis, you can encourage spread of osteomyelitis. And I hate the term osteomyelitis because we all say it's bone infection, right? In reality, it's inflammation of the bone, but it's what it indicates is bone infection. <clears throat> you do not have to discontinue negative pressure if there's positive osteo. They just have to be treated for it. Yes, correct. Yep, and I you see that big in Indiana even. It's amazing because in my job, I'm fortunate enough to travel even internationally some now, but to the East and West Coast, mm -hmm. and the different in, in... How they treat. Yeah, how they treat too. And what's neat is, you know, I'm from in Indianapolis, so I'm the same. The Midwest is like two or three years behind on stuff sometimes. And that's an old rule of thought that you, you shouldn't put negative pressure on with osteomyelitis. It is. Go ahead. We have a, a patient that the physician doesn't want to put a wound back on until this wound that's in the groin area and down the thigh gets smaller. What do we, how do we accomplish that goal for a decreased size? His rationale is he'll never get a good seal in the groin area. 
Great question. I love it. Yes, I will, doctor, because how else are you going to get this thing to heal? And I have stoma paste, which is caulk, or I have ostomy wax. So I literally, on a groin wound, it's funny, when I go in there and do one of those dressings, I take two packs of 4 by 4s with me, I take some stoma paste, and I love wax, ostomy wax strips. I love, or Eakin rings if you don't have the sticks. I love those things. Put them in my pocket, let them warm up a little bit. I go into the room with a box of 4 by 4s and every crack crevice that drape is coming in contact with, I go ahead and shove it in every crack and crevice in the area to let it dry out, to wick away the moisture. Then I literally caulk my, I cut my foam, put it in there. Instead of window painting with drape, I window paint with two tubes of stoma paste around it or osmi wax because it does the same purpose. The whole reason why you window paint so the foam doesn't touch good skin. But now I window paint with wax and osmi paste so I caulked now dressing on and you can get a seal. And I'm telling you guys, I know it's, it's frustrating at times, but those are some tricks that you can use. Um, you know, sometimes we, we, I've done wounds that I've had a half inch of good intact skin between the labial folds to work with. And I literally run, I use wax there and put it on there. And it, it takes a little time to figure it out and then push my drape into it. If you, you can generally get a seal if you use those techniques. And what's neat is you can maintain a seal too. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, yeah, hydrocolloids, yep. Yep. To get a seal. Correct. Um, the only thing you got to be careful, so using a deuterm and leaving thin or hydrocolloid of any point, is unless you get a cut it out of the middle and one big circle to window pane, the cracks where it joins together, if you don't bring your drape past that, it can cause air leaks. So if you're just sealing on the deuterm itself, make sure you fill those cracks with some stoma paste because the air will leak right in between them. Yeah, like a diabetic wound foot, I never, ever, I don't even teach to window pane with drape. I always use a leave-in uh, thin or a hydrocolloid of some type because a, a diabetic foot especially, you have so much calluses around it, they never pair it far enough back. So the wound's actually bigger on the inside than the opening. So that always turns wet and nasty, the wet band-aid look. So I always window pane with a hydrocolloid in those situations too. Um, because the worst thing you can do for a diabetic foot is have it wet or have it macerated. But yeah, on those difficult wounds, I always say, hey, that's why, you, why, why I'm a nurse. I'll figure that out. I'll get a seal. Um, and using stoma paste or wax, you can get it. But the most important thing is it maintains it too. What time is it, you guys? Does anybody know? Five. Yeah, Five. Oh, not too bad. I looked at my watch and I just realized it's it's broke. <laughs> I'm like, that does a lot of good. So, um, just a couple other things. You know, with the contraindications, um, there's a lot of controversy on fishless. Remember, fishless is an ostomy that's not put there by a surgeon. Many times, a fishla has a wound associated with it. It's okay to treat the wound around the fishla with negative pressure. That's fine. You just can't put negative pressure on top of a fistula to control the drainage. Makes sense? So a lot of nurses believe if I have a big abdominal wound and I got old faithful in the middle of it and my fistula pouring stool out, a lot of nurses believe I can't use negative pressure. You can use negative pressure on the wound. You cannot use negative pressure on an enteric fistula to control the drainage. So a lot of times that's the only way you get those wounds healed. You'll have nurses do two different things with fistulas. They'll either take Eakin rings and build up a little mountain and put an ostomy bag on it and then put the foam around it and seal and get all creative. I was never that talented. I isolate my fistula with a piece of zero form and put the, um, literally cut a piece of zero form, put it over the fistula, put my foam directly on top of it, protects the fistula, and actually we had great success with them to actually um, self-contain themselves and reseal. So it's okay. As long as you protect the Correct, because the fistula itself is, is small bowel. You know, that's what's protruding out um, in, in a way. Um, so small bowel, smooth muscle, the foam will eat it too. And what's nice about Zeroform, and I'm not a big fan of Zeroform at all, but I love Zeroform in fishless because it isolates them and a lot of times it will help granulate them over, believe it or not.
Some, I've seen some amazing stuff with it. Um, the other thing, cancer, which makes sense, because if you put something on negative pressure with cancer in the wound, I'm not talking I have lymphoma, but I have a wound. I'm talking about I have a wound with cancer in it. If you put negative pressure on that, it's going to make it grow like wildfire. Um, of course, never put it over vessels or blood or um, organs. It will erode them too. I've seen it happen. I've seen it not on purpose, but a groin wound and the femur artery um, was just underneath some escar, and I ate through the escar into the femur artery in the patient. The patient didn't die, but I'm surprised he did not. It happened in the hospital, but um, patient risk factors, you guys, and then I'll probably close about right here with any questions. Risk factors are, it's suction, right? If they're at risk for bleeding, then they can bleed. Um, the other thing is infection. That's actually your biggest risk factor over bleeding. I get the question asked a lot. You know, a pressure wound, I don't worry about bleeding that much because by nature, they're created by cutting off the blood flow um, to that wound, so they're not really vascular wounds. But I'm always a little leery on abdominal wounds and, and you know, groin wounds. They're highly vascularized. Those should be watched and paid attention to. Um, I get the question too, how soon can you put negative pressure on post debridement? There's not really a standard, but if someone's on Coumadin or another blood thinner, I usually wait a day. It's not worth it, um, especially if it's a abdominal or groin wound. If, if they just debrided a small little part on a, a stage four on, on, the, you know, on the buttocks area, I'll probably go ahead and throw it back on actually. It's just all about assessment. Um, groin abdominal wounds, I usually stay away from at least for four to eight hours four to eight hours. Pressure wounds, it depends how massive the debridement was. You're, you're generally pretty safe, but it does need to be monitored. It just depends if your patient's alert enough to watch it and along those lines. Do you have much experience with the, um, especially in the head of the ego? I have. We, it being such a low... Um, Intensity? Yes. Low flow. So yeah, I, I don't. I don't want. I'll just talk about. Um, I don't want to talk about someone else's product, but I will talk about the, the principle of of incision line management. And those type style of negative pressure were originally made for incision line management. Um, they are made to decrease seroma formations and decrease SSI surgical side infections. Um, they work great. Medicare, PDAC, everyone else. It's not research proven yet, so no one will reimburse for them. So it's a physician code. Now home care can bill for them too. If I, you know, I think it's yeah, everywhere now. But home care can order and bill them for. They work great for that. They're awesome. I do have not seen much success, and I know they're promoted to use them on hardly any other type of wound. It's a different mechanism of action. They're handy though, and they're easy, and there's not much to mess up on them where you're gonna harm the patient. That's why people like them. But they don't work either, a lot of times on those. And you see more and more of those type of um, being promoted on diabetic wounds and stuff. But what I always try to think is, God, this is a diabetic patient, I might have one shot at this. And fine, I'm gonna try it, but if I don't see progression after two weeks, then we need to switch to traditional negative pressure. And that's why there's traditional negative pressure and there's still the incision line negative pressure. Um, but they've promoted it, I don't want to say them, but that style of negative pressure has been promoted as an easy alternative. It's an alternative for surgical site, you know, you know, small incision lines, even incisions dehist maybe a little bit, great, works awesome, but it's not a replacement for a traditional negative pressure platform. It is. Yeah, it's tough. So, those are great questions, though. What are your thoughts on HIST? On what? I, I've seen it work a ton. I used to use it. If it's called early enough, like DT, if it's, what I was taught MIS was good for with stage 1s and stage 2s and also DTIs in early stage, I saw a lot of them not convert. So, I was a fan of it. Now, I've seen it used more and more on more of a full thickness injury and the, the mechanism of action of MIS therapy, ultrasonic, it kind of defeats the purpose of, of saving the dermis at that point when it's a full thickness injury. But I'm, I'm not a, I'm, I'm, 
I've seen it work well at times. So it depends on the type of Depends on the wound, like anything else. I mean, you know, most of these dressings that are out there on the market, they'll work if they're using an appropriate type of wound. You know, uh, traditional modality treatment will work to heal a wound versus negative pressure. It just might take four times as long, and then now four times on patient might be in and out of the hospital three times. So, any other questions? Yeah, this might be a silly question. Nothing silly. What? Besides the construction on 70, by the way. <laughs> That's silly. Clean technique versus sterile technique. Great. Great, yep, on dressing changes. I get this all the time. Everybody in this room, unless you work in a burn unit or unless you work in surgery, every wound is contaminated. I don't want to say contaminated, is colonized. Wounds in the type of settings we're all dealing with here are clean technique style. The patient's touching it. They go to the bathroom, I mean, the aerosol in it. So I, I know I get that question a lot. Even, even in the hospital settings and stuff, only time we ever did sterile technique was in the OR. You know, a fresh wound was created. You know, that's OR. But even a surgical abdominal wound comes colonized in about 12 hours. I mean, it doesn't take long at all. So most facilities, most research recommends clean technique. Now, burn patients, we used to do CEAs, which is cultured epithelial autographs, which will a one by one inch piece of skin is about $1,800. We did those sterilely because we didn't want to take any chances, but it took about six hours to do a patient chest and by laying these down. But no, every wound that, especially a pressure wound, anything along the lines, like, it's a clean technique wound. So. Cultures. Cultures, I think, are worthless unless you do a punch biopsy. Every wound's colonized, what are you going to figure out? And something else too, everybody wants to treat wounds with IV antibiotics. Or they want to treat with oral antibiotics, right? Especially a pressure wound. Okay, me mechanism of action is pressure, right? Yeah, it means I cut off blood flow to the area, so I'm going to treat an infection with it? With it, is systemic? No. Wound care needs to be looked more looked at at the topical or local level, so that's where the specialty dressings come in, even Dakin short term acetic acid and stuff like that. Oh, well, especially you know, people do a swab culture wounds like, hey, you're gonna get staff, really? I mean, it's it's all the natural flora that's living on your body anyway. If you're really concerned about wound, because sometimes on wounds that don't heal, people forget to ask one question: Do they have an autoimmune disorder? Um, oh God, yeah. I have alkalosing spondylitis, for sure. You know what? That I do. So I'm at effect for a wound called PG. And those are the types of wounds that don't ever heal. And those are the good ones to do a biopsy on or a culture because you can't get it to heal and they don't look quite right either. Makes sense? So, um, but a punch biopsy is at least a true deeper biopsy if you do do a biopsy. You know, I think they're five millimeters. Yeah, because everyone wants to, what's the what's the Z pattern called with a swab? I mean, you just you might as well swab it on their chest or on their buttocks because it's going to be the same bacteria. And, and it's not really treating it. I mean, that's natural flora. That's fine. Usually a wound's not healing. It's usually nutrition. But if their nutrition and everything else is fine, it's usually some type of autoimmune disorder that's going along with it that's, that we've missed. So even when it's like smelling really bad? Why? Like Why? I mean, sometimes they'll, they'll do it, see what strain of pseudomonas they have. Um, but, you know, I, if you read any new literature and stuff, and I'm big f treating it topically. I mean, because we used to culture stuff in Burns too. Cinerobacter, oh really? We knew that. You know what? Oh, it's, it has a um, pink tinge to it and it smells kind of like a fish. Oh, it's a Cinerobacter. Um, we're going to treat it the exact same way. So we're going to use silver and a lot of it. And so it kind of depends what you're going for. Some people say culture just because they don't know what else to do. Culture it. But if you're really hitting a roadblock, then I'm not saying culture is inappropriate, but it needs to be a true culture, a, pump bi or a punch biopsy. So you can get at least clean tissue, see if the tissues underlying are truly critically colonized with something. That's my feedback. 
You guys, any more questions? I appreciate for letting me come in today. I love it, so hope you guys find it beneficial. So thank you very much for having me. Have a good day, you guys. Thank you.